Today's World Insight, the race for a COVID-19 vaccine. How far along is research? Is it panacea for a pandemic? Still will need to go through a testing procedure to see what works. And accurate, timely information, a cure for viral paranoia. In the words of the UNDP resident rep in China. There's all these rumors and conspiracy theories right, that will lead to irrational uh, behavior. Finally, a ballerina's business struggles how she survived outbreaks. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Today, we will focus on COVID-19 once again. Chinese respiratory specialist Zhong Nanshan says measures against the pandemic should not be reliant on herd immunity adding a coronavirus vaccine is now the priority. Dr. Zhong adds there is no targeted therapeutic COVID-19 drug and international cooperation is still needed for the research. Speaking of vaccine research, I talked to Dr. Seth Berkeley, an epidemiologist who's also the CEO of Gavi, which is the Vaccine Alliance, a global health organization dedicated to improving access to vaccines in developing countries. Let's listen in my conversation with him. And I'm joined by Dr. Seth Berkeley, CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Dr. Berkeley, welcome to the program. It's good to see you again. Very nice to see you as well. Dr. Berkeley, tell me more about what you know of the latest human trial of the vaccine candidates going on in the United States and also seems elsewhere as well. So first of all, um, you know, it is early days. Obviously, we're only about three and a half months into this epidemic. And it has been somewhat remarkable how quickly we have seen candidates move forward. Of course, we hope that those first candidates are going to provide um, protection, but we just don't know. And so the critical issue is to make sure we have a full set of candidates from around the world that are moving as rapidly as possible and ultimately to see what works and then how we make those available. But Dr. Berkeley, no matter how fast it is, even already jumping to the uh, clinical trial on humans, uh, it would not be able to help this time, right? I mean, if the... Well, the pandemic, it's already become a pandemic from epidemic, uh, can be contained for this year. Well, first of all, um, I, have to, I have to commend China. I mean, you have done a remarkable job, and I certainly want to commend the health workers working on the front lines yeah. who have dealt with this, this terrible epidemic. Um, you have done heroic measures to try to control the spread for the people of China, but for the people of the world. And by the way, while I'm at it, let me thank China for stepping up its help for the rest of the world as, as the situation has gotten somewhat better in China. Mm -hmm. But what I think we have to remember is we don't understand does this organism give long-term protection? And of course, uh, if we were to go back to the normal way we operate, would we just see a re-explosion of the cases? And, and, and that, I think, is the question that people will have to talk about. Today around the world, it is about how do we stop the epidemic today? How do we mitigate the consequences of it? Mm -hmm. But the longer term question is, um, we can't do this forever. We can't have full social isolation. And um, what we're going to need to stop that is going to be um, a vaccine that is able to protect against the disease unless it turns out that over time there is population immunity. But of course, to get population immunity would mean infecting a lot of people, and that may not be the best solution. So what we have to make sure is that that vaccine is moving as quickly as possible. Yeah. We don't know. Perhaps there is going to be some seasonality of this vaccine. That would be good news. Perhaps there will be a slowdown after control, but we have to worry about this reappearing, and that's mm -hmm. why vaccine work is critical. We, we think about some of the current candidates already in clinical trial or human trial. Can we give a time frame 
for the shortest possibility of time, at what time it's likely to come into being. I mean, eventually become a vaccine that can be injected to uh, people who are seeking vaccines. Uh, but uh, if it's not successful, what can we rely on related to the technologies of vaccine? Uh, Dr. Berkeley. So, of course, the answer is uh, we don't know because yeah. we don't know which candidate is going to be the one that is ultimately going to be promising or which candidates. That being said, the traditional time for vaccine development has been 10 to 15 years. With Ebola, we were able to do a rapid clinical trial, and then that vaccine was available in experimental form for a period of time before we had a final licensed product. So the the process from starting that clinical trial to having a licensed product in that case was uh, around four and a half, five years. Mm. What people are hoping is that with every effort made to speed this up, that it could be as short as 18 months to two years. But of course, that's going to depend upon having the right technology, having the right results, and making sure that the process you know, goes without any hitches at all, because we'll need to see that this vaccine works in different age groups and different people. Right. And um, we can accelerate many aspects of the work, but we can't accelerate everything. We still will need to go through a testing procedure to see what works, and we'll have to understand safety, and we'll have to figure out how to manufacture this at scale. Yeah. It is possible that vaccine will be available once we know it works in small amounts to be able to use in an emergency situation as part of a clinical trial. That's what we did with Ebola vaccine. Mm -hmm. And we were able to control two major epidemics and ultimately then to create a licensed product that we're now having available in stockpiles to make sure that there aren't uh, further outbreaks spreading as badly as the ones that, that did in 2015 and, and more recently I in North see. Kivu. Yeah, Dr. Berkeley, another thing related to it is, uh, you know, the genome that were put out by the Chinese scientists the two weeks after uh, the cases were discovered in China at the very beginning, uh, whether it is still likely to support the work of making vaccines as the virus is continuing to spread and it's going into different generations. So uh, will that be enough or likely vaccine have to be made for virus at different generations? In other words, once a vaccine is being made, will they still be able to help people when the virus is already becoming different? That is a great question. Um, and, and, you know, we have examples of both. As you know, every year, we have a new flu vaccine that is based upon the local circulating strains because of all the changes that occur. On the other hand, we've had a measles vaccine that has worked for more than 50 years and has not had any problem uh, with the changes. The changes that occur, and of course all viruses will have changes, mm -hmm. what really matters is how does it affect the part of the virus that is being targeted by the immune system. And so there is not, there, the, the genetics of it is important, but what we really care about are the pieces on the surface of the virus. Mm -hmm. and, and that we have to understand once we know how we're going to get protection for this disease. The world is already tracking that. They've divided now worldwide strains into, last I heard, three different clades, three different groups and families of this virus. So already mm -hmm. there's been some change. But the vaccine, if it targets a part of the virus that is conserved, it may protect against all three of those, or it may be that as the virus changes over time, we may have to adapt our, our vaccines going forward. There are many scientific questions that still remain, but what's important about this is that most of those can be solved, but that's why we need a truly global effort to try to, to, try to answer this. And by the way, it was remarkable that China was able to sequence this, this virus and get that out to the world two weeks after it was observed. This mm -hmm. is just incredible work. And again, China needs to be commended for that. That's Dr. 
Seth Berkeley, the CEO of Gabi Vaccine Alliance, telling us about the technical details behind some of the vaccine candidates for COVID-19. After this break, we're going to be back listening to him about the importance and the kind of international cooperation needed for a successful vaccine possibility. We'll be back after this. Since the coronavirus emerged as a global threat, researchers across the world have been working to find a vaccine to halt the pandemic. World Health officials acknowledged Wednesday that scientists are getting closer at an impressive pace to developing a vaccine, with the first human clinical trials already underway in Seattle, Washington. But as we all know, developing a new vaccine takes time, and they must be rigorously tested and confirmed safe via clinical trials before they can be routinely used in humans. A vaccine is at least a year to 18 months away. Experts agree there is a way to go yet. Earlier we talked about the technical part of it. Let's talk about <laughs> the reality part of it. Uh, compared to Ebola, the outbreak of Ebola um, about 10 years ago, now you see the world has been a little bit different, to say the least. Uh, geopolitics and politics, nationalism, things like that. I don't want to throw the big words here, but the reality is that once the vaccines are being made, um, tested, and can be put into the market, whether the world will be able to share it or it's likely to be nationalized by whichever country, well, uh, uh, of course, I think nothing talks about the importance of having a global view as this particular outbreak does. Although the first identification of the virus was in China, um, obviously this is now uh, uh, in over 140 countries. And so we need to understand that any infectious disease, any time can do that. But second of all, we also need to understand that the best ideas, the best technologies may come from any of the different countries. And it may come from multiple countries. We may have a vaccine from one country, an adjuvant, which is a stimulant to make the vaccine work better from another country and a manufacturing from a third. So from my perspective, we need to think of this as a global solution. The other issue is that we don't know in 18 months where the epidemic will be, and therefore the vaccine needs to be made available wherever the epidemic is, because if we have large groups of people in the world with an uncontrolled epidemic, it threatens the whole world because mm -hmm. it can reintroduce as we saw it happen in this case. So. You know, from my perspective, science is global, and so does this response need to be. Um, of course, every country wants to make sure it has access of the appropriate tools for its citizens, but it can't only be for its citizens if it wants to make sure these epidemic stops. It has to be a global perspective. Uh, one has to uh, bear in mind that uh, even for organizations like yours, there are major funding coming from certain countries or you know, from A country or country B, uh, will that have an impact on your decision and the way of doing things? Will that put a limitation on uh, the kind of cooperation you could have uh, with either countries or organizations or individuals? So I think the wonderful thing about the multilateral system is that, um, you know, we receive funding from all of the G7 countries, but we also receive um, funding from all of the BRICS countries. Mm. And, you know, we're working with a wide range of supporters. And so there is a governance mechanism that obviously each donor has a voice in and each companies, because we also work with vaccine companies across the world, both in developed and developing countries, mm -hmm. and, and obviously working with many recipient countries, they all have a voice in the governance mechanism, but nobody has a controlling voice. And so the idea here is that we work for the good of the world. Of course, from time to time, we will be going out and asking for more money, and we're in a replenishment period now. Mm -hmm. We fund ourselves every five years so that it's not about every time something happens, you go out and ask for it. It's rather, how do we build a system that can operate um, for the good of the world continuously over a time period and adapting? Mm. 
if politics is not a problem here in this issue, what about money? I mean, now we've seen uh, pharmaceutical companies that have been running around, running against the time to develop uh, the vaccine. We also see labs active around the world trying to do their work in this regard. But um, once the vaccine is being developed and also produced, will there be killer price for them? and will people be able to afford them? So first of all, I, I didn't want to imply, if I did, that politics is not at play. In, a, in an epidemic like this, of course, there is going to be politics at play. What I'm saying is that the importance is to isolate the truly global mechanisms and make them be driven by science and not politics mm -hmm. as much as possible. In terms of finance, I do think the world will need to step up because I think one critical question is going to be how do we manufacture large amounts of this vaccine because there'll be enormous demand for this, both from places that have acute disease but also from the worried well. And so we need to make sure we'll have adequate quantity of the vaccine to be able to use it to control the epidemic. My own perspective is that vaccines are a global public good. Most countries provide the basic vaccination for their children and it's not done for by being paid or in a commercial market. Of course, companies are involved and they make profit in it, but the purchaser is the governments. That's true in China, it's true in the United States, it's true in Europe and most of the world. Last question before we go. As someone who has been working on vaccines, looking at epidemics uh, developed at different stages at different times, what do you worry the most and what would you suggest is a solution for those who are watching uh, our interview today dr berkeley well of course at the end of the day i worry that we have the best science making the products but what i worry about of course is that a product that is not available to where it's needed does us no good and that's the fundamental reason gavi was set up because new vaccines, the science is moving so quickly and so well, but these new vaccines weren't available to people who needed them the most, those living in the poorest countries. And that was because of cost barriers and systems barriers. And mm -hmm. so we work to try to solve that. And as I've said, have been quite successful. But we know it is evolutionarily certain that we will continue to have outbreaks of infectious diseases. The President Xi has said this as a priority for China. We need to be better prepared, but that's true for every country. So how do we put that system in place so that when a disease occurs, we have a vaccine as yeah. soon as possible and it's made available to those who need it? That's what drives me. And it's the opposite of that that would worry me that we didn't make sure that we made these things available to everybody who needed them. Mm. Dr. Seth Berkeley, CEO of Gavi. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Keep yourself healthy and also your family, please.